Hi, I'm Dr. Jay Herndon. I'm a mathematician from Chicago, Illinois, and today I'm going to talk a lot about real analysis. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through a list of every topic that I think you should know if you're studying real analysis. So just to be clear, this is undergraduate first semester real analysis. If your school offers more semesters of real analysis, this is just the first one. So let me show you the topic list. Um, it's quite long, so I think the video is going to be pretty long. So my plan is just to go through this one topic at a time and tell you a little bit about what's going on. Um, and I'm going to put this list on my website. You can download a copy. Uh, I'll put the Google Doc version up so you can actually edit it if you want to add notes to it. So my intention is to kind of give you like a, a bird's eye view of real analysis without going into the details. So I think it might be a good thing to go through if you're just getting started and you want to kind of see where you're headed or if you are preparing for a final and you want to like put together a study guide, this might help you find some areas where you need to study. So, uh, oh, before I forget, uh, I also offer private tutoring. So if you're interested in real analysis tutoring, I'll put my, uh, my contact info in the description of the video. You can just get in touch with me through there. All right. So on to real analysis. So real analysis is the study of real numbers, and it's about certain properties of the real numbers. Um, so for example, you can add them together or multiply them, or if you've got two of them, you can compare which one is bigger than the other. Where a lot of people like to start when studying real analysis is with the axioms for ordered fields. So this is a list of basic properties that the real numbers have. Um, I'll pull up that list here. So there's kind of uh, two kinds of axioms. There's the field axioms. Those tell you how addition and multiplication work. And there are the order axioms. Those tell you how the ordering works. Um, completeness is another axiom, and I'll get to that in a little bit. But my point here is uh, an ordered field is anything that satisfies the field axioms and the order axioms. And one of the assumptions in real analysis is that the real numbers are an ordered field. So they satisfy all these things. Oh, and the point of these axioms is, of course, to prove things from them. So most everything else in real analysis is going to follow from these axioms. All right, with trichotomy, uh, I want to mention trichotomy as its own topic um, because it's, it's a property that the real numbers have. The trichotomy says that given two real numbers, A and B, there's three mutually exclusive cases. Either A is less than B, B is less than A, or A and B are equal. So that's trichotomy. Um, I'm mentioning it as its own topic because uh, it is, it's actually an organizing tool. Uh, many of the proofs in real analysis are going to be organized around this concept. You're going to want to prove something about a pair of two numbers, and you're going to organize the proof into cases using trichotomy. So I think it's worth mentioning on its own. Um, I want to mention two related functions, the absolute value function and the distance function. Uh, you already know what these are. So the absolute value function takes as an input x, and the output is the absolute value of x. It's how big the real number x is, just ignoring the sign. And the distance function takes a pair of real numbers, and the output is the distance between them. So if the input is the pair x, y, the output is the absolute value of x minus y. So uh, 
you know a lot of things about functions, I want to encourage you to think about these things as functions. So there's like a domain and a codomain and a range, there's pre-images, all those things. Um, so that's the absolute value function and the distance function. Okay, uh, next topic is the triangle inequality. So the triangle inequality is, uh, it's an inequality about how the sides of a triangle are related. So let me draw the picture. If you think about vector addition, this is the vector x, this is the vector y, and then if you add these vectors, you get this vector x plus y. So the triangle inequality is saying the size of this vector, like the length of this side of the triangle, has to be less than or equal to the sum of the other two lengths. So that's the picture in two dimensions. Uh, when you draw the picture in one dimension, it's harder to see the triangle. So if you're just drawing triangles in the real number line, like here's zero, and then if this is x, and then uh, let's say I'm putting y here, starting here and ending here, then this vector is x plus y. And part of the point of this is uh, on the real line, x and y might be pointing in opposite directions, so when you add them together you get some cancellation, and then the sum of those vectors becomes smaller because of that cancellation, so it's on the smaller side of the inequality. So that is the triangle inequality. And you usually prove the triangle inequality pretty early on in real analysis. Um, so I linked one proof here. Uh, if you are really studying this stuff, you definitely want to learn the proofs of these things. Um, so uh, here's one proof on proof wiki. You can read the details if you want. There's a couple other proofs too. Okay. On to completeness. So completeness is another axiom. It's something that we're assuming is true about the real numbers. Um, so uh, along with the ordered field axioms, we're assuming that the real numbers are a complete ordered field. The intuition behind completeness is that uh, we're assuming there aren't any holes in the real number line, but there's a few ways to actually say what that means. So the Wikipedia article has seven different versions of completeness. Uh, the least upper bound property is a good one to start with. Uh, it says that every non-empty bounded subset of real numbers has a least upper bound. I think Dedekind completeness might have been the first one I learned about, and Cauchy completeness is a good one too. I mean, all of these are great. You should learn them all. But you're going to have to start with one. So what your real analysis class or book is going to do, they're going to pick one of these to use as an axiom, and then they're going to prove a few of the other ones. So that is completeness. And I want to talk about constructions of the real numbers. So up until this point, everything has been a property of the real numbers. Some properties were assuming, like the ordered field axioms. Uh, other properties we are deducing, like the triangle inequality. But when you're constructing the real numbers, it's completely different. So what we're trying to do here is uh, build the real numbers from some simpler, more easily understandable number system. We're trying to justify that there really is this, this set called the real numbers, and it really does have all these properties. So how do you construct the real numbers? There's a bunch of ways to do it. So the Wikipedia article is pretty good. Construction of the real numbers. They've got these explicit constructions. 
uh, probably in your real analysis course, they just pick one of these. So popular choices are the construction from Cauchy sequences and the construction by Dedekind cuts. So there's there's when you're studying abstract math, there's two sides to this. You want to study the properties, but then you also need to justify that there is something that has those properties. So you have to construct it. And there's also this math overflow post which talks about how uh, mathematicians nowadays think about the real numbers. So if you've studied real analysis before, I think uh, you, you'll find this post interesting. All right, moving on to the first major topic, sequences. And I think you should split this up into two subtopics. There's sequences of real numbers, and there's sequences of functions. So starting with sequences of real numbers. So you should certainly know what the idea of a sequence is. A sequence is an infinite list of real numbers. And you should also know the technical mathematical definition. So a sequence is a function whose domain is the set of natural numbers. You think about this function as taking input n, some natural number, and producing as output the nth term of the sequence. And there's a few special kinds of sequences that come up over and over in analysis. So you've got bounded sequences. Uh, a sequence is bounded if there's some real number a and some real number b, so that every term in the sequence is bigger than a but smaller than b. And uh, this one is a huge topic, convergent sequences. Uh, I want to write down this definition because it's one of the most important definitions in the subject. A sequence x sub n converges to L, that's a real number, if for all epsilon greater than zero there exists a big N, a natural number, uh, so that whenever little n is bigger than or equal to big N, we've got that the distance between the nth term and L is less than epsilon. So this is a very fancy way of saying uh, the distance between the terms and L is getting arbitrarily small. So one of the most important uh, definitions in all of analysis is the definition of a convergent sequence. And then you've also got monotonic sequences. So uh, a sequence is monotonic if it doesn't zigzag back and forth. So there's two kinds of monotonic sequences. There's monotonically increasing, they always go up. There's monotonically decreasing, and those always go down. And there's kind of two variations of each one of those. So you've got uh, weakly increasing, so maybe it goes up but sometimes stays the same. And then you've got strictly increasing, so that would be always going up. And then same thing for uh, weakly and strictly decreasing. So now it's time for the first theorem I'm going to mention, the monotone convergence theorem. Um, so theorems in math are true statements that have proofs that, as a community, we've all agreed are really important ideas. So uh, the monotone convergence theorem says if you've got a sequence that's monotonic and also bounded, then it has to be convergent. So it's relating all three of these special kinds of sequences. If you've got a sequence that has this property and this property, then it must also have this property. And the point of having this theorem is, say you want to prove a sequence converges, 
oftentimes it will be easier to show that it's monotonic and bounded without having to use the for all epsilon definition of convergence. So that is the monotone convergence theorem. Next, I want to talk about Cauchy convergence. Um, so Cauchy convergence is pretty similar to regular convergence. Uh, the main difference with Cauchy convergence is you, you don't want to mention the limit. So I'll write down the definition. A sequence x sub n Cauchy converges if for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists a natural number n, so that whenever you've got m and n, which are greater than or equal to that natural number n, uh, the mth term and the nth term uh, have distance less than epsilon from each other. So I like to think about it like this. A sequence converges if there is uh, a limit that the sequence is bunching up around. A sequence Cauchy converges if the sequence is bunching up around itself. So that's Cauchy convergence. So I should definitely mention this, this key fact about the real numbers. Uh, if you've got a, a sequence of real numbers, then it it's Cauchy convergent if and only if it is convergent. Um, so even though these aren't defined the same way, every sequence with one property also has the other property. So they are the same thing for uh, sequences of real numbers. All right, next up is subsequences. So let's say you start with a sequence x1 x2 x3 x4 x5 and it just keeps going if you remove some of the terms and leave infinitely many terms left over then the thing that is left over is called a subsequence of the original sequence so it's a sequence obtained from another sequence by removing some of the terms. And uh, the main theorem about subsequences is the bolzano weierstrass theorem. It says that if you've got a sequence that's bounded, it has to have a convergent subsequence. So bounded is not enough to get you convergence, but it is enough to get you a convergent subsequence. So that takes us to sequences of functions. There's a lot you could say about this topic, so I'm just going to say a couple of things. Um, importantly, there's two different ways that a sequence of functions may or may not converge. One way is called pointwise, another way is called uniform. Pointwise convergence is not very good, uniform convergence is great. So. Uh, I can say a little bit about what these two things are. With pointwise convergence, you, you pick a point in the domain of the functions and look at what happens to the sequence of outputs uh, at that input. In uniform convergence, you don't pick a point in the domain, you, you look across the entire domain all at once. So. You can click through to the Wikipedia articles if you want to see the definitions. I'm going to skip them in this video. Uh, but a couple facts that you should learn how to prove if you're studying sequences of functions. I think you should learn how to prove that any uniformly convergent sequence is a pointwise convergent sequence. So the better property implies the worse property. And another good fact to know is that uniform convergence preserves continuity. So if you've got a sequence of functions that converges uniformly and all of the functions are themselves continuous, then the limit function will also be continuous. So that's why it's better, uh, along with many other reasons. Uniform convergence preserves continuity. You, you can't 
replace uniform with point wise, it won't work. All right, next on the list, metric and topological properties of the real numbers. Um, the study of metric spaces and the study of topological spaces are very much their own things, but they start with real analysis. So one way or another, you're going to learn a little bit about metric spaces and topological spaces while studying real analysis. So a few of the key concepts are, uh, there's this idea of a bounded set. So for the real numbers, uh, let me just say it this way, a subset of the real numbers is bounded if there is some real number A and some real number B so that everything in the set is between A and B. It's basically the same definition for a bounded sequence. And then there is the topology of the real line. So topology is the branch of math where you study pictures, uh, but you're not studying them like you would in geometry where you assign length and angle measurements. You are doing things more like counting the number of components in the picture and that sort of thing. So a few of the key ideas are, I think you should know what an open set is. Uh, so you already know what an open interval is. An open set is a union of open intervals. A closed set is one whose complement is open. And then uh, a connected set is basically a set that can't be split up into two open pieces. So it's sort of fundamentally one piece. And uh, the definition for compactness is a little bit more subtle, a little bit more elusive. Um, but basically, compactness is a kind of smallness for topological spaces. Um, so finite sets are compact, but there are lots of other sets that are compact that are not finite. They're small in a different way. Um, but it's a huge topic. I don't think I should say too much about it here. A few of the key topological facts about the real numbers. A subset of the real line is connected if and only if it's an interval. That proof isn't too hard. I think it's worth your time to look at it. There's the proof wiki link there. And uh, a major theorem in real analysis is the heine borel theorem. It says that a subset of the real line is compact if and only if it's closed and bounded. So the significance of this is uh, compactness is a hard property to state but it's a very useful property to prove things from. Closed and bounded, these things are usually not that hard to check. So it's usually easier to check that a subset is closed and bounded and then deduce that it's compact without having to check directly that it is compact. So uh, heine borel theorem, it's a classic. Uh, I hope you enjoy it as much as I did when I first learned about it. Next topic, continuity. One of the most important topics in all of modern math, so this will be good. Uh, so I want to mention that uh, continuity is a property of functions. A, a function may or may not be continuous. And the idea there is that a function is continuous if small changes in outputs come from small changes in inputs. I think that can be a little counterintuitive the first time you study it because the outputs come before the inputs. So I want to pull up the definition, the epsilon delta definition, just so you see what I'm talking about. So here we go. Uh, a function f from a domain d to the real numbers is continuous at x naught in the domain if for every epsilon greater than zero, there is a delta greater than zero, so that for all x in the domain, whenever the distance between x and x naught is less than delta, we have that the distance between f of x and f of x naught is less than epsilon. So what did I say? Small changes in output come from small changes in inputs. Well, what this is saying is, if you want the outputs to be within epsilon, 
you can guarantee that happens by making sure the inputs are within delta. So small changes in output come from small changes in input. So that's the epsilon delta definition of continuity. Um, and I'll just mention it. Uh, the way this works is first you define what it means for a function to be continuous at a point in the domain. And then if it's continuous at every point in the domain, then you just say the function is continuous, period. Uh, there's also a very related idea of a limit of a function at a point. So make sure you know what that is. Okay, moving on to examples of continuous functions. Um, so you already know many examples of continuous functions from calculus. So like the absolute value function, polynomial and rational functions, trig functions like sine and cosine, exponential functions like e to the x and 2 to the x, uh, those are all examples of continuous functions. So you took calculus, you already know that these are all continuous, but the point in analysis is to prove they are continuous from the epsilon delta definition of continuity. So most likely, whatever book you're studying or whatever uh, class you're taking, you're going to go through these and prove each one is continuous. And the really good stuff is the counterexamples. So real analysis is famous for having cool counterexamples. There's actually a book just of counterexamples. So counterexamples in analysis, uh, this is basically just an encyclopedia of interesting counterexamples. Uh, if you're into that kind of thing, you should pick up a copy and look through it. And I want to mention a couple examples of functions that are not continuous in interesting ways. So there's the Dirichlet function. Uh, this function is defined like this. The output is 1 if the input is rational and 0 if the input is not rational. So that function is not continuous anywhere in its domain. And you can modify this idea to get something called Tomei's function. So this function if the input is rational, you write it as p over q in reduced form, and then the output is 1 over q. And if the input is irrational, then the output is just 0. So if you try to graph this function, it looks something like this. And this function is continuous at all of the irrational numbers in the domain but it's discontinuous at all of the rational numbers in the domain. So it's very unusual property for a function to have. Uh, it's continuous and discontinuous on these two sets that are sort of like interwoven together. Anyways, read the article if you're interested. I don't think I should talk about it too much more here because it's kind of uh, mind-bending. So I'll come back to interesting counterexamples later. Uh, for now, I need to move on. So I'm going to talk about combinations of continuous functions. There's many ways that you can take two continuous functions and combine them to get another continuous function. So let me say a few of those. Uh, you can add them together. You can subtract one from the other. You can multiply them together. You can divide one by the other as long as you're not dividing by zero. And you can compose one with another. So if f and g are continuous, f composed with g is continuous wherever it is defined. I put a couple stack exchange posts here. Uh, they've got some detailed proofs. So like this is the proof that the product of continuous functions is continuous. Feel free to take a look at that. Same thing with compositions here. And now for sequential continuity. Um, so just like with continuity, sequential continuity is a property that a function may or may not have. And a function is sequentially continuous if it preserves convergence and sends limits where they're supposed to go. So let me write down what that means. Uh, f is sequentially 
continuous at C. This is a point in the domain. If whenever Xn is a sequence converging to C, uh, we have that the sequence of outputs f of xn converges to f of c. So if you plug in a convergent sequence, you get a convergent sequence out, and the limit of the output is the output of the limit. So that is sequential continuity at a point. And just like with continuity, a function is sequentially continuous if it is sequentially continuous at every point. So a key fact about sequentially continuous functions, they're actually the same functions as the continuous functions. So in real analysis, a function is sequentially continuous if and only if it's continuous. And so the benefit of that is Let's say you want to prove a function's continuous. Well, you don't have to use the epsilon delta definition of continuity. There's this alternative version of continuity. Uh, sometimes this one's a little bit easier to use. So um, I'll let you think about that. And now moving on to the intermediate value theorem. So roughly speaking, this theorem says continuous functions send intervals to intervals. There's a picture that goes along with this. So here, there's a continuous function f. There's an interval in the domain from a to b. And there's an interval in the codomain from f of a to f of b. And the point of the IVT is this. Anytime you take a point in the interval between f of a and f of b, you can find a point c in the interval between a and b, such that when you plug c into f, you get the original points that you picked. So the entire interval from f of a to f of b is in the range of f. So that is the IVT. And then we've got the extreme value theorem. This says, Continuous functions on compact sets take extreme values. This one has a picture too. Uh, there's a continuous function. It's defined on a compact set, the closed interval from A to B. And the point of this theorem is you can find some number C between A and B that when you plug it in, you get the max of the function and a point D that takes the min of the function. So these would be the extreme values of the function. Um, without compactness, this doesn't work. So uh, here is a function from A to B, but not including the endpoints. So there are functions defined on the open interval that they're continuous, but they don't achieve their extreme values. So if you've got something like with asymptotes, uh, this function does not take a max value on the interval from A to B. You need the endpoints to make that work. All right, that is the EVT. And I'm also going to mention uniform continuity, which is uh, it's another kind of continuity that's actually different from epsilon delta continuity. Um, every uniformly continuous function is epsilon delta continuous, but not the other way around. The Wikipedia article has this nice animation. So in red, it's the function g of x equals the square root of x. If you look at this red box, the graph of the function is always on the left and right sides of the box. 
But if you look at f of x equals 1 over x and look at this blue box, every now and then the graph of the function is on the sides of the box, but then sometimes, like when it gets over here, the graph of the function spills out over the top and comes through the bottom. So uniform continuity is like the red one. You can draw a box so that that same box sliding across the graph, uh, the function is always coming out of the left and right of the box. With non-uniform continuity, the function might shoot out of the top or come out of the bottom. So uh, that is uniform continuity, and I'll leave that there. Right, so the next big topic is differentiation. Um, so this is a property that a function may or may not have. A function might be differentiable uh, or it might not be. And the idea is it is differentiable if it can be approximated by lines. The technical definition involves a limit of a difference ratio. So I'm going to pull that up on the screen so you know what I'm talking about. Uh, this quantity f of a plus h minus f of a divided by h is called a difference ratio, and we're taking a limit of it. So a function of a real variable y equals f of x is differentiable at a point a if its domain contains an open interval i containing a and the limit l equals the limit of this difference ratio exists. So that's the technical definition. And uh, examples and counterexamples. So just like with continuous functions, uh, there's many examples you already know from calculus, but then there's probably some counterexamples that you're going to learn in real analysis. So talking about uh, differentiability now, the absolute value function, not differentiable. Uh, it does not have a well-defined tangent line at zero. But all these other ones are differentiable. Polynomial and rational functions, trig functions, exponential functions. Those are all differentiable. Uh, and for counterexamples, I mean, I already mentioned the absolute value, but they can get way more interesting than that. There is something called the Weierstrass function. Uh, that function is continuous at every point, and it's differentiable at no points. So go look that up if you haven't done it already. Those ones are kind of fun to think about. And another part of real analysis is going through and proving all the differentiation rules from calculus. So uh, you already know that uh, the derivative is linear so you know what I'm talking about. Uh, if you take the derivative of alpha times f plus beta times g, it's equal to alpha times the derivative of f plus beta times the derivative of g. This equation holding means the derivative is linear. And you've got all the classics, the power rule, the product rule, the chain rule, L'Hopital's rule. Uh, these things you prove in a real analysis class in, you know, uh, a lecture or two. I think you should also know how differentiability is related to continuity. So every differentiable function is continuous, but not the other way around. Like the absolute value function is continuous, but not differentiable. Uh, here's a Stack Exchange article about that proof that differentiable implies continuous. And the big theorem about differentiable functions is the mean value theorem. So this says that differentiable functions achieve their average velocity. What does it actually say? Uh, well, I'll let you read out more precisely. The theorem states something. I'm just going to look at the picture for now. So here is a differentiable function f in dot. If you think about this function describing the motion of a particle, then the slope of the tangent line 
is the instantaneous velocity of the particle. The slope of the secant line is the average velocity of the particle. And what the mean value theorem is saying is somewhere along the function, there is a place where its instantaneous velocity is equal to its average velocity. These two lines are parallel. They have the same slope. So that is the MVT. And it is time to move on to series. Uh, so a series is, it's an infinite sum. And on the technical level, it is a sequence of finite sums called partial sums. So if you're going to learn about series, I think you have to learn about sequences first, because a series is a special kind of sequence. So in calculus, there are all these convergence and divergence tests. Uh, Wikipedia has this massive article about all these convergence tests. You definitely don't need to know all of these, but it's there if you want to look at it. Uh, I'd say focus on these ones. And uh, not so much using them, but understanding the proofs of why they work. So there's the divergence test, the comparison test, the ratio test, the alternating series test, uh, things that you got familiar with in calculus. It's time to go back and prove that they actually work the way that you think they do. All right, and I also need to mention Taylor's theorem. So Taylor's theorem says if you have a k times differentiable function, then it can be approximated by a polynomial of degree k. So if k is 1, this is just saying that if you have a differentiable function, it can be approximated by a line. That's what a degree 1 polynomial is. Uh, well, that's obvious because that's the definition of the derivative. It, it is the linear approximation. However, let's say you've got a function with a derivative, and that derivative function has another derivative. There's nothing that tells you right away that the original function can be approximated by a parabola. All you know is that the derivative can be approximated by lines. So Taylor's theorem kind of collects all these derivatives into one polynomial. That's the relevance. And I'm putting this in the series section of these notes because the thing you use to approximate the function is called a Taylor series, and you think about it as like an infinite degree polynomial. So uh, there's many different versions of Taylor's theorem. Uh, depending on what, you're, what class you're taking, it might be very simple, like the way I stated it here. But there's also more complicated versions where you keep track of the, uh, the error terms very carefully. So that's all I wanted to say about Taylor's theorem. Uh, if you've got a function that has lots of derivatives, it can be approximated by a large degree polynomial. Okay, last topic, integration. Uh, so just like with continuity and differentiability, integrability is a property of functions. A function may or may not be integrable. And the idea is a function is integrable if there's some way to compute the area under its graph, or the area caught between the graph and the x-axis. So one way to try to compute the area is by using the Riemann integral. So the, the precise definition of this is, is pretty involved, and it has a lot of moving parts. Um, so the Riemann integral is defined in terms of partitions of an interval. Uh, least upper bounds and greatest lower bounds show up in the definition. So there is a fair amount going on. Um, the All the machinery is here on the Wikipedia page if you need to look at it. I've also posted a video a while back where I do some examples of 
the Riemann integral just from the definition. So you can look at that too. And examples and counterexamples. Um, so all the functions I discussed earlier that are continuous, those are Riemann integrable. There's also functions that are not continuous that are still Riemann integrable. Uh, and there's also functions that just are not Riemann integrable. So the Dirichlet function that I mentioned a while back, uh, that's either 0 or 1, depending on whether the input's rational or irrational. That function is not Riemann integrable. There are other more high-tech versions of integration where that function is integrable, but uh, Riemann integration can't do it. So if you study more real analysis, you learn more advanced kinds of integration where you can integrate more and more complicated functions. But in real analysis one, I think Riemann integration is maybe all you need to know. All right, and just like with continuity and differentiation, you want to go back and check all the things you know from calculus. Uh, so for example, the integral is linear. So that means the same thing as before, except with integrals instead of derivatives. Uh, here it is. If you integrate alpha f plus beta g, you get the you get alpha times the integral of f plus beta times the integral of g. So that is linearity. There's also some bounds involving integration that you usually prove in real analysis. So these inequalities. So for instance, the integral is always between these two quantities. Uh, and if f is less than g, then the integral of f is less than the integral of g, things like that. So I kind of already said it, but I want to just isolate it as its own fact. Uh, every continuous function is integrable. There's a proof you can go look at here. Um, and then I just want to connect all these ideas. So uh, differentiable implies continuous, and then continuous implies integrable. All right, and finally, the big payoff at the end of real analysis is the fundamental theorem of calculus, which tells you how differentiation and integration are related to one another. Um, for a very long time, these two things were studied separately. So it is a big deal that we've got the fundamental theorem of calculus that relates them so closely. So part one of the fundamental theorem says differentiating undoes what integrating does. And part two says to compute integrals, you can use antiderivatives. So I just want to look at the Wikipedia article for the FTC so we can look at the theorem more carefully. So the first part of the fundamental theorem of calculus says uh, if you've got a function little f and then you form this integral, call that big F of x, and then you take the derivative of that, you end up with the function you started with, little f. So I said differentiating undoes what integrating does. And look, if you take the derivative of an integral, you get what you started with. The second part of the theorem is about computing integrals. So this is the equation that you use over and over in calculus. The FTC part two is why this equation works. So it says if you want to compute the integral from a to b of a function little f, one way to try to do that is by looking for an antiderivative. If you can find one, call it big F, and then all you have to do is look at big F of b minus big F of a. So I know that you didn't appreciate that when you were a calculus student, uh, but if you think about just how complicated the definition for the Riemann integral is, 
it is really nice that to compute a Riemann integral, all you have to do is look at this. Uh, there's, there's no uh, partitions of intervals or uh, lubs or soups involved. It's just an antiderivative and then plug in the endpoints and subtract one from the other. Uh, it's so easy even a calculus student could do it. So uh, that is enough of that. Okay, that is all I wanted to say about undergraduate first semester real analysis. Um, so I think it should be clear that you're not going to be able to learn real analysis just from this video. It's just meant to be kind of a uh, study tool. So if you really want to learn it well, read as many books as you can and talk to as many people as you can about this stuff. Um, and before I go, I just want to remind you again that I offer private tutoring. So if you are looking for a math tutor, I tutor real analysis, abstract algebra, topology, many other things. So I'll put my, uh, my contact info in the description of the video, and I hope to hear from you. Bye.